Good morning. I can't help but notice, and you might notice, that there aren't very many council members here with us today. Um, currently, there are three or four other hearings taking place at the same time. All are important. And so you will notice council members coming in and out of this hearing with no disrespect to the topic of this hearing. Um, m most importantly, we'll, because it will affect this hearing, there's a hearing right next door about Amazon and the um, deal that was made with the uh, mayor's office and the state without any input from the city council and there's a very important hearing going on right next door to talk about um, finding a way for the city council to have their input, um, which of course a democracy demands. Um, so, so with all that in mind, there may, may be some noise emanating from behind the wall, and we'll all be patient with that. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on female genital cutting, FGC, also known as female genital mutilation or female circumcision in New York City. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women. My first order of business is to acknowledge that I am new to the issue of FGC and I want to learn. I'm asking for your patience as I learn the vocabulary. The goal of the hearing is to start a citywide conversation around the topic and to listen to advocates, healthcare providers, and survivors. Once we gain a sense of the landscape within the city, we can ultimately move forward with thoughtful action. One thing I've learned is that there is no universally accepted language with this topic. With that said, the committee will be utilizing the term cutting, FGC, to reflect the importance of using non-judgmental non terminology. Since we're here to learn and it's very important we proceed in a culturally sensitive and competent manner, witnesses are welcome to use their own term of art. Before we dive in, I want to recognize the brilliant work of our policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, in taking on a deeply complex issue. Her research has presented this committee with factual, balanced information that is aware of the sensitive subject matter. Well done. I encourage all to read the committee report, which you can find online if you're not here in the committee room today. In it, you will find comprehensive definitions, background, and data. FGC affects women and girls all around the globe. The United Nations estimates that over 200 million women and girls have experienced FGC, and that number is growing. In the United States, the latest available data from the Centers for Disease Control indicates that approximately 513,000 women and girls have either experienced FGC or are at risk of being subjected to it. New York, in New York, it's estimated that over 50,000 women and girls are at risk, making our state second only to California. While these numbers provide a big picture overview of the problem, they are dated estimates and the city is sorely missing more detailed, nuanced data that can help us identify ways to address the issue in a targeted and effective way. Such data is difficult to come by due to the nature of the problem. Cultural taboos, discouraged discussion, the categorization of the affected individuals as mutilated or sexually disfigured can shame young women into silence. And many healthcare providers and doctors are unaware of it, of FGC, and how to identify and treat it. 
as there are numerous health complications associated with the practice. It's critical that we shine a light on this. FGC interferes with normal bodily functions. People are very upset about this issue, even in the next room. Sorry, I'm just pausing. No, 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 no need, no need. Can, it'll pick up? Okay. As there are numerous health implications associated with the practice, it's critical that we shine a light on this one. FGC interferes with normal bodily functions and can negatively affect several aspects of a woman's or a girl's life, including her physical, mental, maternal and sexual health. The painful and traumatic procedure is performed mainly on children and adolescents between the ages of infancy and 15. It is performed without anesthetic and frequently without full informed consent. Accordingly, FGC has been widely recognized as a violation of basic human rights including the principles of equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex. In the state of New York, banned female genital cutting under the state penal law um, in 1997. However, there's no explicit prohibition against vacation cutting in New York, which is the practice of transporting minor girls either abroad or across state lines in order to subject them to FGC. As the holidays approach and schools close, we cannot forget that there are girls across the five boroughs who are currently vulnerable to being subjected to FGC. At the federal level, the Female Gen Genital Mutilation Act of 1996 made performing FGC on anyone under the age of 18 a felony in the US, however, this law is, even this law is being currently challenged uh, based on states' rights. Now state and local governments must act to address the growing problem. It's unlikely, however, that we can simply legislate or criminalize our way out of it. And doing so would expose families to the risk of separation, foster care, incarceration, and or deportation. Flyers that prominently display ICE, for instance, will only drive the practice further underground. To begin, I do believe that the city must collect accurate data on the extent of the problem. We need comprehensive partnerships between city agencies and legal and social service providers in order to prevent FGC from happening. Medical providers must be trained on how to identify FGC as well as how to treat it physically and psychologically. Resource centers should be established for women who are at risk or have already undergone FGC. This is an incredibly important yet complex topic. And I'd like to reiterate that I am still learning about the, about the issue. I wanna thank you for coming today. I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony and letting it guide us on how to effectively address FGC in New York City. Before we hear from the administration, I'd like to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well as the committee staff for their work in preparing the hearing. Brenda McKinney, our counsel, Chloe Rivera, legislative policy analyst, and Monica People, our finance analysts. Um, and as I say, committee members and others will be coming in and out to join us, um, but I would like to acknowledge that we have New York State Assemblywoman Latrice Walker with us here today. Thank you for coming, Assemblywoman. All right, um, I'd like to turn it over to my committee counsel. You can please raise your right hand. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond to council member questions honestly? I'd like to welcome Hannah Pennington, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and Training in the Mayor's Office to End Gender-Based Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Thank you. Thanks, sorry about that. Good morning, Chairperson Rosenthal and members of the City Council Committee on Women. I'm Hannah Pennington, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and Training for the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, which we, have now, we are now going by NGBV. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about our office's engagement on the issue of female genital cutting, also referred to as female genital mutilation circ and circumcision. Um, and today I'll use the acronym FGC. I'd also like to thank our part, one of our main partners in this work in the city, the, Com the Commission on Gender Equity, and their representatives from the team we work with here today. Um, on September 7, 2018, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order 36, which expanded the authorities and responsibilities of the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, OCDV, and change the office name from OCDV to the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. While the office continues to develop and coordinate a citywide response to intimate partner and family net violence, it now has the expanded authority to address gender-based violence. Gender-based violence includes sexual violence, trafficking, stalking, as well as FGC. Under this expanded scope, we continue to create bridges across criminal justice and social services to coordinate New York City's approaches and system responses and to ensure that all survivors of domestic and gender-based violence have streamlined access to inclusive and critical resources and services. Additionally, we seek to implement best practices and policies, develop and strengthen services and intervention initiatives, enhance coordination across agencies and disciplines, and employ methods for data and information sharing. The expansion of our mission is a multi-stage process that begins with feedback and information gathering from advocates, community stakeholders, and survivors that will inform our advocacy efforts and recommendations for policies, programming, data, and best practices citywide. The practice of female genital cutting, as defined by the World Health Organization, is all procedures involving partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. It impacts girls and women throughout the United States and in New York City, with the 2016 report by the Population Resources Bureau finding that there were almost 66,000 women and girls aged 15 to 49, including almost 22,000 girls under the age of 18 at risk of FGC in the New York City metropolitan area. The data for the New York City metropolitan area represent 13% of the total number of women and girls at risk of FGC in the United States. There is a strong network of community-based organizations throughout the city that are providing direct services to survivors of FGC and advocating for enhanced resources and awareness. We partner closely with many of these organizations, which generally provide services to survivors across the spectrum of domestic and gender-based violence. For example, several organizations providing services related to FGC are on-site providers at the New York City Family Justice Centers, which are operated by NGBV in all five boroughs. Through partnerships with community-based organizations, we have developed a training for providers and advocates that educate staff on the dynamics and impacts of FGC, best practices for working with survivors, and available resources. We are currently in the process of expanding these training efforts across the centers. We wanted to highlight one recent victory by a city contracted provider working with an FGC client. Ms. K filed an asylum application with the assistance of the New York Legal Assistance Group and its Legal Health Immigration Project at Lincoln Hospital. Based on FGC, forced marriage, and severe domestic violence she had suffered in her home country of Cote d'Ivoire, Ms. K under, um, excuse me, Ms. K had undergone FGC as a young child and has suffered lifelong complications. She was forced by her family to marry an abusive husband, and together they had three sons, one of whom was murdered by her husband's first wife. 
Miss K fled to safety in the United States where she gave birth to her fourth child, a baby girl. Her fears of returning home were magnified further because now she would be powerless to protect her newborn daughter from undergoing FGC. The team extensively prepared Miss K for her interview in July. Miss K was granted asylum. Miss K was connected to Refugee Resettlement Services to help her get settled here in the US and then applied for her sons to join her from Cote d'Ivoire. Miss Kay is overjoyed she is able to remain safely and with her daughter in the United States and that she'll be re able to reunite with her sons. Miss Kay's story demonstrates the need for multidisciplinary services to support New Yorkers who have experienced FGC and other forms of gender-based violence. NGBV has also been a proud member of the New York Coalition to End FGM since it was launched in 2016 and this past October, we co-sponsored the inaugural V March, spearheaded by the coalition and other advocacy groups to raise awareness in New York City about FGC. We look forward to continuing to strengthen support and amplify the work of the coalition, its member organizations, and other community-based partners who are leading a larger movement to bring attention to this critical issue. We also look forward to continuing to partner across city agencies to strengthen city program and responses to, CG, uh, to FGC. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue, and I welcome any question that the committee may have. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to see, I'll be honest with you, I'll be, I'm, I'm glad to see, delighted to see that FGC is under the auspices of, um, of your office. Okay. Um, and so, let's start with um, the connection between your office's focus, the work that you've done, and um, the practice of FGC. What are the biggest challenges and obstacles you see in serving the, these commu the communities that are experiencing FGC? Well, I think that both in your opening and in our my testimony, I talked about the statistics that are available, but I think that FGC, like all of the issues that we work um, to address every day at our office and that many city agencies do and our CBO partners, is that the statistics don't represent the numbers that are happening in, in actuality, and that's true for many forms of gender-based violence. Um, so I would say that we, along with the entire spectrum of gender-based violence, are really eager and pleased that under the auspices of our expanded office, um, that we've been able to already undertake comprehensive listening sessions with the stakeholders across the city, in our city partners and CBOs, to better understand um, the challenges and the gaps and the barriers, um, many of which we're very familiar with from the years, the already 17 years that our agency has been doing this work, but we want to be very deliberate around um, working with communities to find out where those challenges, to understand those challenges even better. Are you making uh, efforts to collect data? Um, well, so, you know, we collect data through our contracted providers who do, do work across the spectrum of gender-based violence, um, not just through NGBV, but other city agencies. Um, and that's one of the issues that we will look to coordinate our efforts around um, data collection and data sharing. Okay, I think the most recent data is from 2012, is that right? I'm not sure the source. So the source is through the population, I believe you're referring to the CDC data, which is the basis for the population. Um, so currently that's the source that the city's using? For the people who may be at risk at FGC as well, and I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. I thought you meant in terms of services that were being provided, but yes, that is the, that is the statistic that we referred to. Right, so there's gotta be some coming together from the sort of grassroots up. Yes. In terms of data collection, and it sounds like your office is willing to jump in and try yes. to coordinate that? Yes, and okay. also wanting to um, look at it as as we do with all these issues, to make sure that we see that it's a nuanced issue and yeah. even the numbers that we're able to generate won't necessarily represent the problem. Um, so in doing the work we do to, you know, our commitment to raising public awareness is, is recognizing that. Okay. 
Um, I'm wondering about the interaction between your office and the Commission on Gender Equity, um, and specifically, where do you see that intersection on this issue? Um, I mean, I think that we're thrilled to partner with the Commission on Gender Equity and their fantastic partners. We just, together um, with their you know, yeoman effort, um, celebrated an amazing 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Um, and we have, before our expansion even happened, had discussed this issue with them and um, invited them to join us in our partnership with the coalition, the New York Coalition to End FGM. Um, so I imagine that that partnership will continue. I mean, we see that, you know, obviously um, working to combat gender inequities is interrelated um, intensely with our efforts to combat all forms of gender-based violence. Are, is uh, NGBV on the Sexual Health Education Task Force? I'm actually a member of the task force. And is that topic being discussed as part of um, trying to tweak the curriculum in our we schools? We are looking forward to raising that issue along with the whole spectrum of gender-based violence. When I joined the task force, it was before our expansion, but I was incredibly pleased by the task force leadership and all of the members' eagerness and willingness to see the connection between our comprehensive health and sex education in the city as part of our, our efforts to prevent gender-based violence. Um, and we talked at length and the report references sexual violence, um, prevention, intimate partner violence, prevention, trafficking, and other forms of gender-based violence. So I, I think that we'll be eager to continue to com the conversation with this particular issue as well, and I think it prevents a great opportunity. Do you know if there are any deliverables on this with expectations, timelines? On the task force? Yeah, with this specific issue. The task force is reconvening early in 2019, um, and I'm not entirely sure, um, as I'm not part of the leadership, what the next steps are, but um, I know that the, re the I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I, we can follow up with you about that. That'd be great, I'd appreciate it. Um, could you uh, talk a bit about, back to the issue of the coordination within City Hall and this administration, um, there's a, an Office of International Affairs. Do you know if they're doing any work around CEDAW or around this issue? I'm not entirely, I, I imagine that they are, and that is one of the ways in which we'd like to expand um, our footprint on this issue. Great, if you could get back to us on that, that'd be interesting. Um, so, are you including, I'd like to welcome Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel from Brooklyn um, in joining us. And I'm gonna proceed with my next question, but if there are questions you have, uh, please let me know. Um, do you think that uh, FGC could fall under the definition of domestic violence in New York City? I think that FGC could cut across multiple forms of gender-based violence and those kinds of definitional issues of where um, this kind of issue and other issues fall because in, within the definition of def the broad definition of domestic violence, which includes family violence um, and other forms of gender-based violence, that kind of definitional question is exactly what we're doing right now and why we are engaging our stakeholders in listening sessions to make sure that we have a consensus on those points and that we are all using shared language and, um, and that we're looking at the nuances of the issue. Um, I wanna get back to our schools just a little bit and uh, vacation cutting. And given that the school year, you know, we're about to be at the point where the kids are gonna go on vacation um, is there anything now in the DOE where we're educating teachers um, about, you know, how they can be hearing what kids are saying uh, before vacation and afterwards? 
I, I think that in a huge part of our um, efforts and my personal portfolio is enhancing our engagement with DOE on the entire sector of gender-based violence and making ourselves available to support training efforts for teachers and staff throughout the schools um, and would be eager to talk with DOE about a specific um, partnership to help them in, in that kind of training effort. I wonder, um, I hear the willingness and I appreciate that. Um, you know, it, in my mind's eye, just, you know, it's one more vacation time going by without action. Um, so again, I think it would be interesting for this committee to know about um, timelines and I, I'm really pleased to hear that it's on your radar. Um, so then the next question is sort of what and when? I think it's, it's definitely on our radar. Um, I believe it's on the coalition's radar and there are representatives from the Department of Education on that coalition, so it's certainly something that we can all work together on creating more concrete steps. Okay. Um, so let's uh, dig into some details about how your office um, uh, works in terms of uh, getting information out about the practice and even vacation cutting. So since the New York State law of 2000, um, I think it's 1998, not remembering, 1996. So since the state law addresses, uh, includes that um, in their public health law section, um, public education and outreach about FGC, I'm wondering, one, if the state provides any resources to do that outreach, and I'm wondering how your staff, um, how your office uh, implements that mandate. It's 2015, just for the record. For the uh, facilitating FGM yeah. law, exactly. Um, well, our office is committed to raising awareness about this issue and are really glad to have been asked to be at this hearing um, and to work with the coalition to co-sponsor the inaugural V-March that happened in October of, excuse me, September of this year. Um, and are eager to use this exploratory part of our expansion um, implementation to identify all of the options that are available to address this issue, including um, a, a deep commitment to raising awareness. Do you mention anything about FGC on the website? I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I believe it's included in the definition of gender-based violence that is now included on our website, but I can make sure of that. Yeah, could you contemplate um, having a page devoted to information education? Yes, I and mean, we are go undergoing a lot of um, efforts to enhance our public messaging, our social media, and our website, so absolutely we can include that in um, you can, our, or it's part of the strategic plan? Yes, yes, we can, we can look into those kinds of um, web pages and already are considering ways to enhance our web, web page. And also um, NYC Hope, our web-based portal for survivors. Do you have any, uh, are you contemplating trainings or public education sessions um, or actually providing funding to the organizations that do this? We have always conducted trainings on FGEC at the Family Justice Center since the, you know, since the inception of the Family Justice Your Center. Your office or an, an? In partnership with our partner, on-site partner agencies, which is how a huge amount of the training that we provide to partner staff happens. So in partnership with various organizations, we've made that kind of training available uh, what we're trying to do right now is to make sure that we do that in a more consistent way to make sure that across all five boroughs 
and in terms of time that that's happening on a more consistent basis and we're already partnering with um, organizations to start that process. Do you fund those organizations? The city, um, both NGBV and others, have uh, contracts with many organizations that provide services across the spectrum of gender-based violence, which can include, like the case that I referenced in my testimony, mm -hmm. um, FGC. Can you name two nonprofit organizations that you contract with? In that do FGC work? Yeah. Um, well, NILAG, which I mentioned in our testimony, Eagle. is a contracted provider. Um, Sanctuary for Families is a contracted provider. Okay, but anyone specifically on this issue only, like not, a, not doing housing work, not doing legal, not doing advocacy, but any group that specifically has um, expertise on FGC? I would have to get back to you on that question, but like I said, we provide, um, we contract providers who, who work across the spectrum of gender-based violence, including FGC. Okay, the committee would like to know um, whether or not you provide, have contracts, and um, given the unique uh, topic, it strikes me that uh, the comp cultural competency would be paramount in trainings um, or even thinking about resources above and beyond working with a coalition, but actually the city investing its own uh, resources into these organizations. I'm going to very quickly say that I find it awkward, and I'm sure anyone watching this hearing finds it awkward, that two white women who do not come from this culture at all are discussing this topic. And it was critical to me that um, I, I just want to acknowledge that actually it was Councilmember Amprey Samuel who suggested this as a topic, and I really appreciate that uh, very much. So I'd like to turn the questioning over to you, if you have a moment. And I do apologize for my lateness. I was custom. <laughs> um, and I do appreciate um, you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for taking the lead in the city um, to figure out a way that we can all um, be responsive to a need that a lot of us did not know even existed. Um, I've had a number of discussions and conversations with um, globalizing gender, and it just made sense for us to be a part of the um, outreach efforts and um, figuring out how we can partner with the organization. Um, and I was honored to be able to participate in the V March in October. Um, but just a little, so it's, it's near and dear to me because I used to work on the human rights portfolio for the State Department um, in Ghana, in West Africa. And my job um, with the State Department was to go throughout every single region in the country and interview families and mothers and girls and, um, and ask them about um, health issues and maternal child death issues. And in, what, what stuck out the most was we had so many young girls who were going through this process. Um, but a lot of uh, families did not talk about it. But it was my responsibility to do the investigative work and report back to Washington um, within the human rights report, the country human rights report. And the level of resources we would provide the country was based on how they protect their women, their girls, the children. And um, that's how this country operates on a diplomatic level. And to come back home and see the numbers of women and, um, and girls that this has a direct impact in the United States was a bit alarming. They were, and for me, I felt like it was a contradiction because I'm assessing um, how 
girls are protected in another country and we look at those countries, but yet we do it right here um, in the United States and trying to figure out how we're protecting our girls here. So with that being said, um, my role right now is to figure out what can we do um, with the administration, with the various agencies that, um, that can provide a level of support or education. And so for me, is there anything we can do uh, with 311? Because we talk about 311 a lot and calling 311 if you have a question or if you want to um, file a complaint. Um, have there been any 311 calls across the city that you are aware of and folks wanted to know if there were any resources? Um, have you seen any kind of utilization of 311 um, as it relates to FGC? I don't specifically know, but we can explore that. Um, we, um, you know, we, um, rely and partner with a lot of CBOs and other organizations like Globalizing Gender who have very, um, strong, um, leadership and expertise in this area. So we would look forward to exploring, um, you know, whether those calls are being made or what else we could do, um, to make sure that if that happens, that the right information is there. Mm -hmm. So the federal government has a tip line, right? And when you contact the tip line, they do um, stir individuals towards resources. And, um, but it starts with the government. And so um, as we are moving into a new budget season and everyone's talking about, even with NYCHA, how can NYCHA residents um, be able to utilize the 311 tool because they can't right now. So um, uh, is there a way we can um, not just put the onus on the organization, but be able to really come up with a plan, um, a legitimate plan to say that um, if we train the 311 operators, um, on uh, like where they can call or reach out to and just have an intentional effort to, util to, to train the 311 operators and be able to come up with where they can route um, individuals to, even if it's to um, the, uh, the, the city agency and the mayor's office. Um, that seems like something that we can do pretty quickly and it doesn't have to take like um, analyzing and um, you know like round table discussions or oversight hearings it's something that we can actually do like this is an issue we can um, do like an ad campaign about the issue and then stir people to call 311 yeah so we work closely with 311 and call to have calls patched to our family justice centers and to other organizations and through our web-based portal NYC hope so um, we we are happy to explore um, your idea I'm going to take that interruption uh, as an opportunity to recognize Councilmember Ben Kalos, a member of the committee. If you could continue, Councilwoman. Okay, that's it for now. So, um, I'd, uh, if you have a moment to stay, I'd love you were in the middle of a flow there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> A really good flow. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we've taken notes on that, and uh, you know, it's just such a great idea to um, make sure our 311 operators are culturally competent to know the words mm -hmm. that they're hearing, but also to know where to send um, people. And that's why I was asking about contracts with culturally competent organizations because it would be great if the city does um, fund these organizations, have contracts with them, um, it would be great that, that the 311 operators could actually send, send people to those organizations to do the work that, um, of cultural competency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Council Member, I'm gonna come back to you whenever you're ready. Are you ready now? Go ahead. And I apologize, I did come in late, so I'm not sure if you asked any questions about the medical facilities. Okay. Um, okay. Um, just based on the level of, yeah, based on the, the, the 
level of research that has already been done and the work that you've been, been um, that's ongoing with different organizations. Um, how are medical facilities in New York City equipped to deal with cases that come in of SGC? Health and hospitals does have some specialized services for FGC survivors, and they also, there are two clinics for survivors of torture are available and accessible to um, survivors of FGC. Which, did you already ask which ones? Which, oh, okay. <laughs> which um, facilities, medical facilities? At are? Gouverneur Hospital and Bellevue Hospital. Okay. And when, can you get, Can you take us through like the steps of what that would look like? So um, you have someone come into the hospital and um, in ex they're going through this particular experience. Um, would it be like if the family is with the young woman, would they have to request um, additional assistance or um, is it a situation where the, um, the young woman is taken into a separate room and um, and then maybe a social worker or um, you know a, a, a certain um, section of uh, and I don't want it to relate it to um, like if someone is experiencing trauma or rape victim or you know and it's like a whole process of procedure protocol would it be um, similar to like those steps if someone goes into a medical facility I'm not entirely sure how it would work in any one particular situation. I do know that FJC is part of the didactic curricula for all H&H &H residents and um, that there's, I, I, um, I'm not sure entirely of what the protocol is, but could certainly um, see if we can find out for you. Do, you, do you. Is there one? I mean, maybe there isn't, but. I would have to defer to H&H &H on that. Okay, okay. And DOH and MH as well who have clinics that are accessible to folks. Okay. It's sort of, um, it's hard. I, I want to acknowledge that you're in a difficult situation because you uh, represent an, an, or an agency that is sort of wide, wide uh, your fingers are in every agency but don't necessarily have the answers from any one specific agency. Um, and, uh, you know, we should think about following up uh, in a public fashion with the Department of Health and Health and Hospitals um, to learn um, the details. Because I think they're, they're pretty important. Um, I actually am going to step away for one minute to step into the Amazon hearing. And Ben Kalo, Council Member Kalos has a question, so I'm going to turn it over to him and turn over to uh, Council Member Amphrey Samuel, Chair of the Hearing. Thank you. I want to thank uh, our Women's Chair, Helen Rosenthal, for bringing attention to this issue. I can't believe it happens here in the city. I want to thank Council Member Alika Amphrey Samuel for her leadership, for her advocacy for this hearing, for her passion on this issue. Uh, as, as a man, I'm doing my best to try to get up to speed on this. So for me, I, I think about this from the victim's perspective, and I guess the first question is just what resources exist to tell young girls and young women that FGC is illegal, that it is something they can say no to? What partnership is there with the Department of Education, with our social workers in the schools, with others to ensure that children who are facing this situation have somebody they can turn to. In the instance where we have somebody who is not interested, it seems like there's a lot of focus on the victims of FGC, but not as I'm not seeing anything so much about the prevention. Is there a partnership uh, with ACS to ensure that there's outreach to communities where this may be occurring or more likely to occur to make sure that the children know that there's a way out. Is there a partnership with people who live in these communities who, uh, I, I, I grew up as an Orthodox Jewish person, I'm, I'm now more conservative, and even within the Orthodox movement, there are 
to be frank and honest, there's Orthodox Jewish people who are not comfortable with LGBT. There are Orthodox rabbis that I know that will do, will, 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 are, are accepting of it and will even perform the wedding regardless of whether or not there are consequences for their ordination. So in terms of partnering with members of communities where this is likely to happen to identify people who are willing to keep a person who is choosing not to go through this uh, and whether it's done for a religious ritual or other, but protecting, because I guess just from the victim perspective, saying no is a lot of unknowns. One, you're, you're losing your, likely possibly losing your family. You're possibly likely losing your community. You are possibly likely losing your faith. And there's a lot of unknown. So what are we doing to let folks know that they can say no? and that they will be all right, that they will get to go on with life, that they will have a loving family to welcome them, that they will be able to maintain and remain a part of their community and their faith, and that they will be able to go on to college and move along with their lives. NGBV is committed, as we, um, I referenced in my testimony and earlier, um, to raising awareness on this issue and in our um, implementation of our expansion that happened this past September. Uh, we are conducting listening sessions with stakeholders from across the city and across communities um, to make sure that we're identifying, exploring all options, um, and included in that effort is the kind of uh, prevention work that you're, you've, you've referenced, to ensure that we are uh, coordinating efforts for people who have experienced FGC, but also people who are at risk. Would you voluntarily, without us doing a reporting bill on the topic or doing a task force for a study, just let us know where you are with ACS and DOE in terms of preventative work and identifying, and if you could share with ACS uh, or share with us the list of communities you feel that there might be risk as well as uh, have ACS share with you and us, foster parents and other resources and community-based organizations and communities that are able to help these children remain whole throughout their lives. So your question is whether we are committed to partnering with them on, on this issue? Not, not only committed, but willing to share your progress on it. I think the worst thing we can do is often a, a, a bill. Our preference is to just work with people voluntarily to keep up. And just if you can share it with our women's chair in Alika and uh, let me know how it goes. Uh, this is something they've been a champion on. I just, I would love to be able to sleep tonight knowing that our kids will be in a safer position. Those, the listening sessions began just in October because the expansion happened in September of this year. Uh, so we are in the be beginning stages of implementing our expanded mission. Um, and DOE and ACS are a part of those um, discussions and those efforts. But I don't have any more specifics that I could share right now. So it's a commitment to continue to share with the committee chair and Ampre Council Member Amphrey Samuel and myself as you progress. Okay, yes, we can, we can continue to share information. I think I'm gonna I'm just jump in on there on that point, because um, I'm, I'm realizing now, I've only been in the council, it's going on my first year, I'm completing the one year soon, um, and I'm noticing that um, a lot of the round table discussions and listening sessions and folks at the table um, don't necessarily um, include people that should be at the table. Um, so I'm gonna use this opportunity since I'm at a table um, <laughs> to just provide you with my input and feedback. Um, I used to work at ACS. I used to be a child protective specialist in the Brooklyn field office. And it was my role and responsibility, my job, to go into homes and um, investigate allegations of abuse and neglect. And I did my fair share of removals if I felt that there was a need. Um, but I also went into homes and um, saw things happening that I didn't know anything about. Um, and I think that when my colleague, Kalos, Council Member Kalos mentioned ACS, and um, 
it, it reminds me of, and he also mentioned um, different areas where we may see this uh, more prevalent than others. I think to the Bedford Field Office in Brooklyn, which sits in Bed-Stuy. And we know that a lot of the cases come out of um, the Bed-Stuy area in central Brooklyn. Um, it, maybe there's an opportunity there um, with the new CPS workers that are being trained, and we know that there's a new process of training um, the new CPS workers. There's a um, role plays, and they built out these um, simulated um, homes and apartments. That wasn't there in, in the late 90s when I worked at ACS, um, but I think that that's a great opportunity to maybe do some um, role playing and um, opportunities to, to maybe do a pilot at the Bedford field office um, um, and utilize the new training mechanisms that are in place to include um, FGC and, and the people in that particular community um, if you want to be able to have a real conversation. And, um, and we're always talking about pilots and pilot programs, so maybe that's an opportunity there. And that's my suggestion. Let the record show you're smiling and nodding. <laughs> um, we, we partner with ACS um, on training efforts, um, and we would be, I have to defer to ACS on a pilot project, but would be happy to explore that as an idea as well. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. Um, thank you. Um, for being here, but Council Member Amplissimo, did I, am, are you still on a roll? Yeah. Are you good? Okay. And Majority Leader, let me know when you're ready. Okay, for questions. Um, I'm gonna move on uh, to actually Sort of following up on the notion of the 311, um, asking whether or not uh, the federal government at one point had a tip line. Um, it's unclear with this administration whether or not that tip line is continuing. Do you know whether or not there is one, a hotline, and whether or not, do you know, is the city contemplating um, creating a hotline on this issue. Um, there are hotlines on a number of issues, but this one in particular. I don't know, but we can follow up with you on that. Again, um, I appreciate the follow-up. Follow-up on whether or not the federal government has a tip line, or follow-up on whether or not the city would be interested in setting one up? Both. Thank you. Um, do you happen to know if um, the city has investigated any cases where FGC is happening? Um, either through the Human Rights Commission or some other area? Um, I don't know if there's been any specific investigations. I know that um, FGC could potentially fall into the context of child abuse, um, but I'd have to defer to ACS on that question. Does the, do you know if H and H keeps records, um, medical records, about if I missed the first part, you said if. Do you know if H and H keeps medical records, or either through their um, primary health care sites or the hospitals, on individuals who have undergone FGC? Do they track that? I'd have to defer to H and H on that question. Okay, could you contemplate um, as an administration asking them to include that question? as you're going through the, the medical background of someone, at, uh, even you know, starting with the pediatrician, um, asking that question. 
I think I'd have to defer to h and I know it is part of the curriculum that the residents and other staff receive, but in terms of actual data collection, I'd have to defer to them on that. You know it's part of the curriculum, sorry? It's part of the curricula for residents, the didactic curriculum for residents at h and But I don't know the substance of that um, sure. training, so I'd have to defer to h and on that. Sure. H&H, &H, I think, works with the affiliate hospitals, the private hospitals, to do the training programs. So do you think the private hospitals are doing that then? They're like the, I don't know, Mount, whoever we have affiliation agreements with these days, Columbia, Presbyterian, Cornell, whatever, NYU, whatever they're called. I mean, I, I guess I'm getting to are you confident that it's in the curricula? Across the city? Yeah. I not confident, but okay. we could we could find out. Okay. Um, I'm not, not confident. I meant I'm it's not okay. yeah, I'm not confident it, in my answer um, to you on that. Commissioner, it's totally fine. I'm getting at it because when when we spoke with the um, the the tiny um, nonprofits that are trying to address this issue, one of their pleas is for doctors to be trained on this mm -hmm. so that um, their response upon seeing something is not a first time response and an inability to m treat someone. And what we're hearing from the grassroots organizations is that there's a lack of knowledge. I would say that exploring those issues in the healthcare setting um, in the public hospitals and in private hospitals is included in the exploration that we're doing um, as we speak. So two of the hospitals have specific, um, what, what was it, the Bellevue and Gouverneur have specific programs. Could you describe those programs again? They have uh, clinics for survivors of tor torture at both of those hospitals. I don't know all of the specifics of the programs and services that are available to people coming to those centers. Um, but in addition to the clinics, h, h does have some specialized services for survivors of FGC. Are those? And this, the clinics are available to people, you know, across the spectrum of not only gender-based violence, but many other issues. Yeah, you read my mind. So. The, in the clinics that they have, mm -hmm. the medical professionals are educated about FGC and are making, infor making this information available to the other medical professionals, nurses. Is that what you think is going on that we can get confirmation on? I, I could work to get that information for you, but I'm not entirely sure how it works. I know that the clinics serve survivors of FGC. Okay. I would be interested in a lot more information about that because, again, from the grassroots organizations, we are hearing a lack of cultural competency um, and, and really inappropriate responses to women when they come in. Um, and one could imagine uh, pediatricians, if, if educated, culturally competent pediatricians being able to talk about the issue fluently with, parent, with the mothers and finding out, trying to find, assess what's going on in a family. I think um, since we have been in this space in a different way before our expansion, we've always looked to those grassroots organizations, some of whom we might be hearing from today, who have that level of expertise and who bring lived experience and also um, a level of cultural sensitivity that we need to bring to all of our work at the Family Justice Centers, but at CBOs that do gender-based violence work across the city. Um, and that's why we've worked to um, bring that partnership to bear in the trainings that we do at the Family Justice Centers. Um, and at the Family our, Justice Centers. But also are eager, you know, 
as participants of the coalition, um, which includes um, many, many organizations but you know that are actually doing the work on the ground, but also other city agencies um, and state and federal partners. Um, so we're eager to continue that kind of work to identify what you're talking about, but also with our expanded mission, um, we really are looking forward to be, being able to, um, to elevate the work that we're doing in that space because of the administration's commitment to having an office that is coordinating um, these issues across the board. You know, it's so tricky for, I think, the administration which is overseeing, you know, uh, agencies that are trying to help eight and a half million people to, um, zone, to, to focus in on one or other tiny community that might be disparate in the city. Um, and um, I just want to again go back to the notion of contemplating contracts in some fashion with the very tiny um, nonprofit organizations that are working on this full time and could be doing so much more. They have the knowledge, they have the expertise and the competency in e even uh, in, in talking to families and, and educators. And um, what, what this committee would like to see is the administration really financially supporting those organizations to do the heavy lifting into the underground of, of what's going on in the city um, in ways that really city government workers might not be able to. This is an, a perfect area where we count on these non, these, in New York City, we count on these culturally competent, tiny grassroots organizations. And I certainly know how challenging the contracting process is, but if there were workarounds, it strikes me this is not something that falls in the category of city individual city council members who have this issue in their unique little districts giving the de minimis amount of funding that we're able to allocate to these organizations. But instead, the administration really owning the topic, recognizing these, these tiny little nonprofits that are sometimes a single individual who are being asked to do this work by some government city agencies, whether it's, you know, yes, I go into the, you know, health clinic and I educate doctors, you know, I've heard quite a bit of that by nonprofits that are a single individual or made up of, you know, a handful of people that have been able to co been cobbled together that get absolutely no city funding to do this work. And yet I think that this is, I think that this is a government, a proper government responsibility. And I do believe in this case that it's not, I'm repeating myself. So um, do you think that's something that your office as sort of an oversight capacity with, you know, what's going on at ACS or um, H and H could be interested in spearheading? I think um, look at continuing to look at the resources that are available and the, the organizations that we partner with is absolutely part of what we're doing in our exploration and in our work with community-based organizations as we move forward in our new um, expanded capacity. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna shift gears for one cent second to the legal world. We all know there's this Michigan court case where um, the, there's a possibility that uh, a state would have the right to determine whether or not FGC is legal. Is that something, uh, depending on the outcome of that case and the appeals that are going on, that the administration is considering going to our state uh, government or or finding ways in city laws, perhaps through uh, the Human Rights Commission, to make sure that in New York City, this maintains, uh, this continues as an illegal uh, activity. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm being educated by my general counsel. There is a state ban, but there are gaps in the ban around vacation cutting, for example. I mean, at this point in time, um, I think it is important for us in our work to raise awareness on this issue, to ensure that people throughout New York City and in communities know that the federal decision that just recently came down does not impact the laws that we have in New York State already on the books that criminalize FGC. Um, I couldn't speak specifically to um, the legal gaps that you, you're referencing to the existing laws, um, but certainly can look into that. But I think it is important um, for us to um, publicly state that because it could, of course, be create chilling effects um, and create concern and confusion to make sure that we're clear about the fact that that decision did not impact oh, okay. um, the New York State laws that we've enacted to criminalize this behavior. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap up um, just being reminded to double double check that you'll send the information that we've asked for on a variety of things. In particular, maybe uh, you have at hand the training that... Um, but I was rem I'm remembering that there's actually a training just next week at the Brooklyn FJC that we're partnering with Sanctuary for Families with um, on FJC. You're partnering with, with Sanctuary, Sanctuary for, for Families. families. Um, one of the trainings I referenced, and I, we can, we'd be happy to send you the flyer and information. Um, it's just, it's very similar to other trainings, so we can make sure that we circulate um, ones that get scheduled in the future as well. And just to be clear, so, so, so the um, Sanctuary for Families is doing the training, not city government. We contract with this organization to do it. It's great. Yep. I just want to confirm for the record, it's not our city workers. That's right. Uh, we, we do it on our city exactly. grounds at the Yes, FJC. our staff who administer the training um, for partner staff and the community and anybody, they're open to the public, um, is coordinated between our city staff who work at NGBV and nonprofits. Um, and sometimes it's our NGBC staff, but sometimes it's our city, our CBO partners, and honestly, sometimes it's both of us. Um, it, it can look different um, in different trainings. But we also would be happy to share um, and make sure you're getting on a regular basis the extensive um, schedule of training that we have at each of the family justice centers um, on a regular basis. And then, of course, we do specialized trainings at, at you know, that are part of the core as well. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, and just so you know, part of the reason that I drilled down on that issue is because um, Sanctuary for Families is a terrific organization, and certainly they should be well resourced to do this work. Um, but there are other organizations, and again, this is awkward between two white women who don't have a background in this issue to be talking about, but they, just to note that there are other organizations, we're going to be hearing their testimony today, who might take a different approach in terms of a training. And, um, you know, I think that it would be great if the, if, if the city would have a good overview understanding of where in New York City there are different communities that may need different cultural competencies to work on it and, and that we were focusing um, in each community with different groups that might be better um, on the issue. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And okay. I would just mention for the committee's reference that our family justice centers, um, having uh, formerly run a family justice center, I can tell you that an incredibly important part of the work as the management of those centers is to not just think about our on-site partners, but also our off-site partners. Um, and those off-site partners are integral to the work that we do because those centers are not just about having people come on-site. It's about connecting people off-site. And, mm -hmm. um, and we happily and um, with 
you know, create um, admiration, partner every day with small organizations that are not necessarily on site. And really what we see is the need to make sure that we're, we're creating access to these services for folks, uh, you know, across each borough. Great, and then on that vein, just wanting to make sure they're getting paid to do that work. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner. I really appreciate your coming today and providing this testimony. We look forward to hearing more from you. Absolutely, my pleasure, thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Um, Mariana Diallo from Sanctuary for Families, Deborah, um, Ottenheimer, thank you, from the New York Coalition Against FGM, and um, Veronese Addis from the Empower Clinic. Empower Clinic. From the Empower Clinic. Thank you so much. I could never be a school teacher. Yeah. Do we need to? Okay. So if you could just introduce yourself, um, name, organization, begin your testimony, make sure the red dot is on when you testify. And the reason being that this, once if it's in the microphone, then it'll go into the transcript. So that's why it's so important that the red dot be on, that you be talking right into the microphone. Um, really appreciate that. Happy for anyone to start. Good morning, my name is Maria Madialo and I am from Sanctuary for Families. I am a program director from Sanctuary for Families working specifically with the African community. And Sanctuary for Families is one of the largest organization in New York State providing services to survivors of gender-based violence, including domestic violence, or trafficking, FGM, and other forms of gender-based violence. I'm also the funder and chair of the New York Coalition to End FGM. We are so grateful to the Committee on Women for this opportunity to testify today. And to Council Member Rosendell and the Council Member Samuel, um, I think she stepped out, who really worked with us during the FGM work, uh, for taking really the lead in bringing attention to FGM. We applaud your leadership in standing for survivors, especially at a time where the health and well-being of survivors of FGM and girls who are at risk of FGM is at stake. FGM is a global public health crisis and a violation of human rights. Around the world, about 200 million women have experienced the FGM. And uh, while it is commonly practiced in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, it is not confined to distant shores. In the United States, it is estimated that about half a million women have either experienced FGM or are at risk of FGM. In New York Metropolitan, about 65,000 girls are at risk of FGM. In fact, for those who do not know, New York is one of the states with the higher number of immigrant families from countries that practice FGM. However, it is very important to keep in mind that immigrants are not the only ones affected. United States citizens are being subjected to FGM. I'm going to call it FGM today uh, because I feel comfortable and I'm speaking on behalf of many women out there who also feel comfortable using FGM. So I met Fatima and Nala in 2010 when they became client, client at Sanctuary for Families. They are sisters and US citizens. When Fatima and Nala were seven and eight, they were sent to their parent country of origin to visit the extended family in one of the West African countries. When they got to that country that summer, they were subjected to FGM by the grandmother. Fatima and Nala has no idea of what was about to happen. They were taken to another location. They were held down, blindfolded, while their genitals were cut off without anesthesia. When I met Fatima and Nala, they were 15 and 16, and it was the first time they disclosed this experience to someone else. They felt betrayed, ashamed, isolated, and they felt withdrawn from their peers. They expressed that they wanted to see a GYN, but they were scared. Indeed, FGM causes a severe physical and psychological impact. 
but I'm going to focus on the psychological today. The psychological impact often include depression, anxiety, phobia, memory loss, and PTSD. Nicole was subjected to FGM when she was seven. She moved to the US from an Asian country where over 50% women have been subjected to FGM. She was referred to sanctuary by a former sanctuary, and she is in college right now. So when I met with Nicole, she disclosed having multiple panic attacks, lack of sleep, nightmares, difficulty concentrating in school, fear of an intimate relationship, shame in seeking medical help, and uncertain about her future. However, through trauma-informed counseling, case management, medical services, and legal services, Nicole received the support and service needed to help her build hope and a new life. As a group of concerned citizens, we cannot continue to allow this happen to more girls and young women in our community. Given the recent decision by the federal judge in Michigan, rolling the 1996 federal law banning FGM unconstitutional, it is now even more we need to speak louder, even more imperative that the city takes the lead in ensuring survivors and at-risk girls have access to the protections, resources, and services they, they so desperately need. Following the 2013 federal law, the Girls Protection Act that criminalized vacation cutting, New York State followed that, that example. It criminalized vacation cutting, and the New York State public health law was amended and added outreach education on the, on the law. However, due to the lack of public funding, service providers are struggling to meet the need of this population. For Sanctuary for Families and our many partners serving this affected population, we welcome support from the city agencies and urge the city council to make this a priority. We identified three main recommendations. Number one, a new New York City focused study on FGM to address the gap in information about this practice and prevalence in the local population. We suggest that the city conduct the study with an extended scope, extensive data collection, and a need assessment based on its findings. Second, Support is needed to enhance direct services for this population, including trauma-informed counseling for survivors and those who are at risk of FGM. They need medical services and legal assistance. Indeed, these are necessary for a survivor to start their healing process, as well as to address the physical impact of FGM. Last recommendation is the need for outreach education and training to service providers, educators, doctors, nurses, teachers, every single professional who can be in touch directly or indirectly with someone who survived it or someone who is at risk needs training. And the communities also that practice it, including families in these trainings, because I think we need to understand better why people do this. Survivors need to be included, girls at risk, and any caregiver. And there should be a multi-level collaboration between direct service providers, local government, local government agencies, such as the DOH, ACS, Department of Education, the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence to identify best practices on how to address these issues and better serve these communities. While we gladly welcome this collaboration between the agencies, funding again at the city level is imperative to ensure adequate resources and protections that are made available to survivors of female genital mutilations and girls who are at risk and, and their families. In closing, we thank the city council members present today for their commitment to address this issue and protecting women and girls in our community. In doing so, you set an example for the state to take actions. 
your support for the proposed recommendations, including collaboration with the direct service providers and professionals who work with this population will help stretch our effort further and make a long lasting impact in the movement to end FGM in the city of New York. Thank you. Cobwebs, continue. I'll ask questions after. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Veronica Addis. I'm an OBGYN here. Um, I run the Empower Clinic for survivors of sex trafficking and sexual violence. Um, I heard you asking Commissioner Pennington about H&H's efforts. She was referring to me, basically. Um, I'm a gouverneur, and then also I was the gynecologist for the program for survivors of torture at Bellevue. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions on that if you have, um, but I'm here with Dr. Ottenheimer, so she's going to also read our statement. Uh, my name is Deborah Ottenheimer. I'm also an OBGYN. I would say between the two of us, we have over 30 years of experience with FGC survivors in various capacities, um, both in the clinic and as advocates um, around asylum seek uh, around asylum seeking examinations. Um, and we really do thank you so much for acknowledging that this is an issue and for ho holding this hearing. It is really an honor to be able to speak to you today. Um, FGC, as we know, is practiced around the world, primarily in Africa. Um, it's really important to remember that it's not just an African problem, um, and it does affect more than 200 million women and girls, as we've heard. The CDC estimates that over 500,000 women and girls in the United States are affected or at risk for FGC, and New York City and environs is home to the largest population of these women and girls, numbering approximately 65,000. Unfortunately, these numbers are really a best guess. They are an approximation of the prevalence of FGC based on country-specific national prevalence statistics and immigration trends from practicing countries. They are not uh, at direct count. Um, there is a pressing need to collect accurate data on the prevalence of women of FGC among women and girls living in New York City and in the United States overall, who have already been cut, as well as the incidence of cut the cutting of girls from FGC practicing countries living. Oops. Living in NYC in order to promulgate policies and evaluate practices. We need to understand the age at which FGAC is performed on girls living in the United States, as well as how often it is performed here in America versus in the family's country of origin during visits abroad or, country, or vacation cutting. We need to understand who is doing the cutting, how it's being carried out, and the types and resulting, of, and resulting complications. Practice guidelines promulgated by the World Health Organization encourage multidisciplinary holistic care for women who are affected by FGC. Nonetheless, despite the high prevalence of affected women and girls in the United States, there are significant gaps in the American practitioner's knowledge about and ability to care for this population, and almost no dedicated medical services are currently in existence. Currently, only Arizona and Boston have such clinics. New York City is home to the largest concentration of affected women and girls in the United States. The establishment of a dedicated medical clinic as well as the systematic education of medical professionals in New York City is urgently needed. It is also imperative that the community stakeholders be involved in the development of medical services and educational tools so that the medical needs of affected women and girls are accurately represented and satisfied. To that end, we urge the committee to consider implementing and funding programs which would enable the following three things. One, the collection of accurate prevalence data in New York City on women and girls who have undergone FGC and girls who may be at risk of cutting. Second, the education of medical professionals in the identification and proper care of women and girls who have undergone FGC. This should include not only obstetrician gynecologists, but also nurses, pediatricians, internists, emergency room personnel, mental health professionals, and any other medical providers who may interact with affected women and girls. And third, and perhaps the most concrete, the establishment of a holistic specialty clinic fo focused exclusively on the care of women and girls who've undergone FGC and which can serve as a model for similar care around the nation. This clinic would provide culturally appropriate gynecologic care, 
obstetric care, dedicated mental health services for women and their partners, and pelvic floor physical therapy, as well as linkages with legal and social services. The clinic services would be designed and implemented in consultation with community leaders and with the guidance of an advisory board comprised of patients, medical professionals, funders, and other stakeholders. And finally, the clinic would conduct research, serve as a center of excellence in the care of women affected by FGC, and serve as a model for other similar clinics in other cities or regions. And finally, the clinic providers would provide expert consultation services to other clinicians, as well as to other organizations and government entities seeking to serve this population of women and girls. And thank you very much. So thank you. I feel like you've answered some of the questions I've asked. Um, I really do appreciate that. Um, and uh, with your patience, I'm going to continue to ask the questions to continue to have on the record your answers. Um, and just for my own edification, is there anyone from the administration still here? OK, thank you. Um, so first, um, I'd like to start uh, with you, Ms. Diallo. Do you think that Sanctuary for Families, given what you're asked to do by the administration, that you have sufficient resources to meet the demand in the city? Well, it's very limited resources if I have to think about only FGM survivors and at risk due to the lack of funding. Like the trainings we do now and all of the type of services we provide into that specific population, we're pulling it from here and there to make sure we're meeting the need of my, our clients. So we're not turning them down because we do not have the resources. So that's the challenge we have uh, right now at Sanctuary. And how many do, staff do you have? Do you think, you know, legal, training, educating, all different counselors, how many staff? To do that? Yeah. Well, I start on my own, like at 2006, when I just started doing the training, really I was by myself, and that was again because of the funding constraints. And then, uh, you know, recently we were able to hire one new counselor within the African Initiative, and she's helping with uh, the work around FGM. But also other staff members within the agency have been trained to do other trainings. And the legal center, in fact, they're providing legal assistance uh, widely to the community, to the African, uh, to the community that have um, either survived or experienced on a legal um, perspective. Do they have a wait list on the legal side? The legal side right now with immigration uh, cases, yes, we do have a wait list, yes. Yeah. And so if I heard you right, there are two people now, and you mentioned uh, an initiative, is that a city council initiative? Which, the African DV initiative? No, this is a sanctuary DV initiative. Got this it. is an in initiative we started in 2006 to respond to the high need of our African clients. Okay, so two people for roughly 60,000 individuals in New York City? Almost, yeah. Just the two people right now. At Sanctuary. There could be other nonprofits that are doing this they work. They are other non for profit, yes. But at that Sanctuary. That are funded to do this work? I do not know any organization that is funded to do the work. Yeah. Uh, but at Sanctuary for Families, what I'm talking is like the clinical department right now, we have like two people who can train on FGM. So just to reiterate, because someone else from the administration just walked in, there are two people to serve 60,000 individuals who um, are affected by this, two dedicated people who we contract with to do this work. Can, can I um, similarly ask the physicians, thank you so much for coming here because you're the ones seeing this day to day. Do you feel that the two centers that exist right now are sufficient? Of course, I heard your testimony, but I'd like you to give more examples about why that answer is no, 
why what you have now at Gouverneur or at Bellevue does not, cannot serve as the pilot location that you are talking about. Why the two locations that you have now are not sufficient in order to collect the data that's necessary. Yeah, I have plenty to say on that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, I started the Empower Clinic really as a response to sexual trauma and sex trafficking, but found that um, I have expertise in female genital cutting because of my background, and there was a huge need, um, and the, the trauma is very similar. And so I expanded the mission uh, to encompass that. Um, and as and over time, actually, my volume has increased in, in terms of referrals for female genital cutting. Um, and, and that's how actually we met. Increased why? Increased Be because of word of mouth. Um, because I, my clinic is by referral only from social service organizations. Sanctuary for Families is the biggest. Um, but also from lawyers um, and seeking asylum for their clients, either escaping FGC or who have experienced it and are trying to protect their children from it. Um, and so over time I have had increasing numbers of patients coming. Um, and so there's a number of challenges there, specifically referring to FGC. One is the urgency of cases. Often people are waiting for a very long time for their dates and they suddenly get a, a court date and they need an affidavit um, to verify the cutting. That's not hard to do, but my clinic is uh, one day every other week at Gouverneur. Um, and Again, it's <laughs> one day every week for 6,000. Every other week. Other week. Oh, every one week. day every other week. Yeah. So two days a month. Correct. You're available. Right. To e provide the um, medical information necessary for an affidavit that would be used by the lawyers in the court case. Yeah, and that's just for the examination. The affidavit I actually write on my personal time. Sorry? Um, the affidavit I write it on my personal time. It's not on my work time. I usually write it on the weekend. Um, and so I have no... 24 days in a year, not including your personal time, is the availability in New York City to, a, to have someone available at a hospital well, there's also Dr. Oddenheimer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Just, I think we're conflating two different Thank issues. You. So, uh, Veronica and I both do two things. One is we do forensic evaluations of women who've experienced FGC in support of their asylum ap uh, applications. Got it. So Thank that's, you. That's yeah. one thing. And the other thing is to actually take care of these women right. at a, in a clinical setting, which is quite different from the forensic evaluation. Sure. Um, we do, I do all of the asylum work on my own time. Yeah. Um, and the, So you're not being paid for that? Oh, I've not been paid for that in 15 years. In 15 and I think years. to Dr. Oddenheimer's point, the, the affidavit's the easy part, uh, um, so easy. other than getting them in. <laughs> and what we struggle with and have discussed amongst ourselves is that um, the clinical care is a really challenging piece of it because it needs to be multidisciplinary and there is no funding for yeah. that. Um, and it needs to be ongoing. And so it's actually very difficult. Right now my clinic does not encompass most of that clinical care. I respond to the acute needs that patients have in terms of trying to alleviate their symptoms, but there's both a lack of data in the medical literature on how to treat these patients. In fact, um, I have a lab that conducts research on sexual and gender-based violence and health, and we conducted a review that found that there's not a single article in the medical literature internationally that addresses the medical care, the medical treatment of um, FGC sequela. There's only surgical treatments, whereas medical treatment is actually the best. So be um, we don't know how to treat them, and I think right. that was something that Dr. Ottenheimer and I wanted to emphasize, which is that right now we're just doing asylum cases because that's the, the most we can do with the resources that we have available. Well, the other thing that we do also on our own time is we try to educate other healthcare providers, but who really, I don't know what the curriculum is that was being referred to earlier, but there is no official curriculum to my knowledge, in, at least in OBGYN, about this issue at all. Um, you learn about it as you bump into it, or through being invited, through, the, through us in this case, being invited to speak yeah, or, or on to that. Add, yeah, to add to the curriculum question, I think that confuses a lot of people when you say curriculum, it's usually defined by the medical school itself. So we have several medical schools in New York City. I couldn't tell you what each one's curriculum is. They are required by a central organizing body to have certain things on their curriculum. 
I don't know that female genital cutting is on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the learning is ad hoc. But I personally trained at Jacoby Hospital, um, and that was where I got a lot of my ad hoc education. Um, and I should add that there are providers in the H&H &H system with expertise on this issue who are not recognized for it or given really the breathing space to develop it. They just happen to know a lot about it and work in the system. Right. They become the go-to person within this the, in, within the hospital. Have you are you familiar with the new CUNY Medical School? Yes. And are they teaching about FGM there? I I do that teaching oh, actually. You do? Okay. <laughs> and that was on your own time. <laughs> yeah, it's on my own time. <laughs> actually, seriously, you don't I, get I'm, paid I'm as serious. like an adjunct to come um, in. No. Um, and that's partly because I feel so deeply about the education need that I'm, I, I'm just willing to do it. Um, it is also with CUNY, I'm working with a couple of providers at CUNY um, around this idea of a clinic in yeah. partnership in an, uh, under the umbrella. I don't think I can say the organization because we're not really in a commitment stage right now. Um, in Harlem, and we're really hoping to, um, to establish at least a pilot program that would encompass this multi-specialty uh, multi approach to the care of affected women and would also produce best practices research um, with the input of community stakeholders. And I don't need to tell you that there's no money it's that's the demand it's is far the the demand is enormous it's it it's it's really big yeah i mean also i think a lot of these women are used to not having services available and so they don't even ask for it and which is the saddest part is that i get sent a lot of people for asylum because that's a very acute and obvious need but then when you actually talk to them many of them are suffering from the sequela whether it's uh, sexual dysfunction chronic pain um, lack of ability to ever have intercourse, um, and they don't know th to even ask for these services, right? And they're so used to being neglected um, that uh, when you say demand, um, what does that even look like when somebody doesn't know they could be getting services? Yeah, and would it be easy enough to add a question to an intake form? I think, I think it's so important to review the intake forms like service providers are using right now. Like if I think about what we did at Sanctuary for Families, um, because we are really working on domestic violence, so many of our clients come in because they are victims of domestic violence. And like when I started in 2006, this is where we start like asking questions around um, domestic violence. And then when the client is in therapy, the client di can disclose, you know, other forms of gender-based violence, including FGM or early forced marriage, et cetera, et cetera. So then what we did is to revisit our intake form so that every single client who walks in, they're going to be screened. This is how right now we're collecting data. But I think this should be really a priority for hospitals and and other you know locations like where we feel like the, the the population can attend and when I say schools it's not only like elementary or colleges they are sometimes the schools there that teach ESL classes but in that process there is no screening they just come to sign one page and they attend the class I think the New York New York City is missing a lot of opportunities to track this population yes. and come up with a, a best solution because the few people who are working on this matter are overwhelmed and they feel like it's their own responsibility because if they don't do it, no one else is going yeah. to do it. So I know the panel, you know, we spoke about lack of money, lack of money, but as you see, all of us, we all doing this with no money because we see it as With no money. No money. Right. Because we see it as our responsibility as professionals. And, and, you know, I feel like there is a lot we have been able to do, but we still have a lot to do again. Okay. I just want to add to the screening question, because I think it's very different in a medical context. I think it is very important for social service providers to do so. 
um, because there are a lot of legal and social consequences. From a medical perspective, screening has a very different meaning, and screening means um, asking or looking into something from an asymptomatic population. So that would be asking a question to every single person who walks in your door. Um, and from a sexual trauma perspective, that's actually very complicated and can really turn off patients from the beginning of their exam. So I actually probably would not want to mandate any kind of screening, but I think it is worth asking the question of how do we collect better data on this subject and how do we do so sensitively um, without necessarily targeting people or turning people off. Also, providers nowadays are, are mandated to screen for so many things that um, it's eating up our time mm -hmm. um, in ways that are very inefficient. And so I would say, I just want to add context, and I could go on all day about screening, but that <laughs> when you ask about screening in a medical context, it has a very different meaning. Right, that's really... And the point about funding, my clinic is unfunded. So Your clinic is unfunded? Uh, yeah. It is supported by Gouverneur Health and full credit to H&H &H and Gouverneur for giving me the time and space. So they, space. they give me um, full... Uh, they lose money every time I see patients, yeah. but um, I do not have any... Funding. I had funding for two years for a psychiatrist. The funding was from the Van Emmeringen Foundation, um, and that really proved the need for a psychiatrist. Uh, but other than that, I do not have funding, and I desperately need it for things like case management and uh, improved follow-up. Yeah, I was just going to ask you of the space to have a case manager there, to have a psychiatrist there. But I'm going to um, turn over chairing the committee hearing to our majority leader, and I know she has questions. I'll be right back. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for organizing today's hearing. I feel like we need like five more, five times the amount of city council members in order to address so many of the issues impacting women, uh, particularly women of color. I wanted to ask, is it documented or well known specifically what regions um, are practicing um, FGC that are, are very, where we're seeing the, the, the highest numbers coming from? And this may have been asked already. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are pretty good numbers for around the world. Um, 28 nations in Africa, but also the Middle East and also Indonesia. Mm. Um, however, uh, many of those internal national surveys are old, um, and they're not always well done. Mm -hmm. um, so the data is there, but it's not great. In the... And also who we see in New York is also influenced by who is in New York. And so even, even though the prevalence is higher in certain countries, those populations may not be as high prevalence in New York. But I see. Right. So, so our distribution of FGC and where it's coming from doesn't necessarily reflect, reflect the, the worldwide world. population. It, it really depends on refugee resettlement and who's in what city. In you know some cities, there'll be more Somalis. In some cities, oh, we'll African, have more yeah. West Africans. Um, so that affects the numbers and also the, the thing, the cultural background, cultural background and the, the, the types of cutting we see. Is it a practice that is growing in the countries or the regions that you named? Is it a practice that's growing or is it a practice that's declining? It really depends on the country. There are some countries where it has been like stagnant, like the same number, like let's say one of the East African countries, uh, Somalia, it has always been 98% of women who have been... What percentage? 98% of women have been subjected to FGM. So you see this is extremely high. But if you compare with um, like the Gambia, uh, where it is a little because of the grassroots movement in these countries fighting to address the issue and try to, uh, you know, find some solutions. But it is very hard sometimes to know it is falling because people do it underground and like countries that, you know, have criminalized it, um, they, uh, instead of doing it when they are a little bigger, like, seven to ten so that they can report they do it on babies so it, it is still in a family like it kept a secret and it is hard to come up with like an exactitude that it is a falling no. even though there is you know the grassroots movement the, I think the other thing you have to remember is that percentages uh, incidence is different than absolute numbers so population is growing in these countries sometimes faster than it 
mm. then the incidence is declining. So absolute numbers of girls who are being cut may be going up, even though the prevalence percentages may be going down. I see. Do you feel that, um, I guess in the countries that we outlined, there must be in some way movement in terms of organizations on the ground that are starting to actively speak out against it. How are those organizations or groups that are speaking out against it, how is it, and I'm sure it's different in every place, but how is it being taken? Are, are those people you know, fearing for their lives or is it something that people respect in terms of people speaking out about it, but maybe not, like maybe they're speaking out about it, but this is what we do, or is it something that is um, protected in a very serious way? It's all of this you just mentioned, in fact. Let me take one specific country. Let's say the Gambia, right? We have a very powerful activist who was a former sanctuary, the client, who was a, he is a survivor of FGM and became a huge advocate, and she created a non-for-profit, uh, Safe Hands for Girls. She is a US citizen, in fact, and then she just took her experience here and went to Africa, said she wanted to end it. So when she started, she said she's going to focus on her own country, the Gambia. She had the support of the government to criminalize it straight away. So that was a good thing. But then when it was criminalized, local po communities, some of them got angry because they saw it as cultural. They said the government cannot dictate what they're supposed to do in their families. So it was a clash. But I think the good thing with her is because she has really the support of the government and many local members, including, you know, um, uh, imams, because most of the, um, the, the majority of the people are Muslim. So Islam is the predominant religion. So she has the support from these um, local leaders and the government and many people nationally and internationally. But it hasn't been easy at all. She can get sometimes a threatened. She has, you know, text messages, emails, but again, because she's working with people around her, she has been able to plan her safety, and when it gets really, really bad, she knows how to act. Let me just, because I want to hold on to this, because it's something you mentioned that I was thinking about as well. So, and excuse my religious ignorance, because I should know these things, but both dominate, dominant religions such as Christianity and Islam do not promote or support um, FGC or is it that these are cultural practices that were in place before those dominant religions um, mm -hmm. came in and over, overlaid over existing cultural and religious traditions? Mm -hmm. So I know, you know, when we talk about FGM, some people may think it is a religious practice, that it is defended by the religion, but it is not in any holy book, in fact. Mm -hmm. However, because it is gender-based violence, like other types of violence, the religion can be used to justify it. But I it see. does mean it is in the Quran or in the Bible, right? Like FGM pre-existed mm -hmm. some other religion, like Islam. Right. So because it was there before Islam, then why when we have the Quran, there is no mention in the Quran? Because the Quran is what we follow as Muslim people. Right. That's one. Number two, the prophet Muhammad, who is, you know, the prophet that every single um, Muslim want to follow. His, he was a polygam. His wives have never been subjected to FGM. His children have never been subjected to children, to, to FGM. So that's why it, there is no way someone can use the religion because it is not there. But people sometimes they can say, oh, if you don't do this in local communities, you're violating your religion. But it's just to say and to to make sure that's a way to put people through it, but it doesn't mean it is in the holy book. And just I, to add I, to that, uh -huh. I just want to note that it's not limited to these communities. It was actually covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield into the 1970s as a cure for lesbianism and frigidity. 
FGC is not limited to these communities that we're talking about. It was covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield in the United States until the 1970s. Yeah, clitorectomy was an accepted medical practice for hyper for masturbation, hypersexuality, and treatment lesbianism. of lesbianism. Mm -hmm. And the last clitorectomy was covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield in 1977. And, and just one point. You know, when we talk about FGM, I think when I was reading my testimony, I said, don't see this as an immigrant problems. Yes. There is this woman, Renee, who has Bergstrom. a last name, Bergstrom. Please Google her. She <coughs> is a white Midwestern woman born here, grew up here. She went to FGM when she was a three because she was masturbating and people from her church said they can cure that. And what they did was to subject her to FGM. And she's white. She was born here. So that's mm. mean it is a global issue. It is not an immigration pro immigrant problem. I need a few parts to this here. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, l let me just, because I know we're limited on time, but yeah. um, more so on the practice side, you're in New York, someone has come to you because um, they have experienced uh, female genital cutting, right? This may have been asked, what legal process could be set off at that point in terms of you're seeing someone, you say, who did this to you? They can say, X, Y, and Z person did this to you. Is it, do you want to file charges? I mean, how does this m maneuver after you've discovered that this has happened to someone and it's happened to someone in this state? So it, it's very complicated. So number one, I think you have to remember that the law is different if you're under 18 or over 18. Okay. So if you're over 18, you have the right to, in principle, you have the right to alter your body the way you want to alter it. If you're under 18, the law is, it, at least in New York State, quite clear that you are not allowed to undergo this genital alteration. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, people come to us for a lot of different reasons. So some people come to us already seeking asylum for forensic evaluation, and that's that legal process has already been begun. If you're talking about um, girls at risk or girls who've been cut, um, I think in, like any other case of child abuse, it's very complicated, but we are mandated which reporters. I mean, I should be clear, I, I've seen hundreds of cases. I've never seen a case of it done to anybody here. So I yeah, have never had to I. deal with that. I know that I know what I would do um, because I'm a mandated reporter. So if you have a child who is subjected or at risk, you have to report that immediately. Um, but the majority of cases that I see are women who had this performed in another country and that I'm helping them handle their social, legal, and medical repercussions of it. And so I do, if, if I encountered somebody who did not have legal representation and may need asylum, then I might recommend them to an organization that provides uh, legal support. Do you think, and this is my final question, and just in conclusion on that thought, do you think that because people, or women most importantly, are looking for health, they're looking out for their health first and foremost, so in the looking out for their health first and foremost, knowing that repercussions won't happen if it was a vacation cutting, do you think that it could be happening here and people have just say, say it happened wherever you, well, you, you went somewhere? You know, look, I'm a data person and so I like to have data. And so I'm not saying it does or, or doesn't happen. I've never seen a case of it. Um, the patients that I see do not want to do it on their uh, children and are trying to protect their children are going through legal loopholes to protect their children. Um, but I think it's very important to understand and, and provide funding to collect data. I mean, that's what I do is that I, instead of making assumptions as I go and I collect data um, to see what's happening. Um, because also if even one case of vacation cutting happens, it's a tragedy. But then if it's so few cases, um, trying to cast a broad net is a lot of effort when actually you could be targeting your efforts more specifically. Um, and so understanding where it's happening, why it would happen, um, among whom is, is really important. But also that I think sometimes efforts get really um, 
far into prevention and forget that there are so many people currently suffering. And so I think I'd really like to highlight that there are so many people currently suffering the after effects and they're really neglected within the medical system. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your service and the work that all of you do. This is really eye-opening um, in terms of the tragic situation that we're dealing with here in New York and beyond. So I really appreciate your dedication, your time, your effort. The lack of resources is criminal, really, that you've put so much of your blood, sweat, and tears into this because you see it as a responsibility, and it is. But we should also be uh, picking up to make sure that people are adequately resourced in order to really have the impact that we want to see. So thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal, because this is really a critical and important hearing, and it's a subject matter that's not really discussed um, broadly or openly, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate your questions. Um, I really appreciate your um, energy and passion around the issue. Um, I, I'm going to wrap up. The, I, I, what I would really appreciate is the opportunity for our committee to meet with you and follow up and learn more. Um, and uh, um, help guide us so we're not going down a rabbit hole that is not as productive as uh, another thing that might be more meaningful for a larger population. And then the other question that I would ask you to think about, we don't need to talk about it now, is sort of thinking geographically about New York City itself, where the pockets of community are. And I don't know if that's something you might already have information about or we could talk about after. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, it's, oh, it's the like Bronx right and now, Upper we can, Manhattan. We can give you a few locations right now. Yeah. In fact, um, I know more about the African community because we- Can you talk into the mic? Thank you. I said I may not have all the information, but I can just share a few that I have right now because I work more with the African community. So it is very hard to say exactly, okay, they are only in the Bronx, but they are in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Harlem. A few um, uh, community from Sierra Leone and Liberia is also in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and I know uh, Councilwoman Debbie Rose has expressed great interest um, and, and wants to be here today, but is in, I think, shuffling between two other mm -hmm. hearings. Yeah. I also want to mention there's a wonderful researcher at CUNY, um, Adiyinka Akinsulare Smith. I can give you her name afterward, it's very long. Can you just um, say it one more time? Adiyinka um, Akinsulare Smith. Great. It's a hyphenated name. Um, and she does wonderful research on um, FGC and couldn't, I know couldn't be here today, but I think her insights are really fascinating, especially in terms of how difficult it is to go and ask questions within the community and how much fear there is. So I think she would be a great resource. Great, thank yeah. you so much. We will follow up with you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Um, Zana Bayaga from Satietu. Um, Patricia Burkhardt from Midwives Women and New York State ALM. Asetu um, Sai from the U.S. Mali Charitable Association of New York City. Apologies if I box that. And Elizabeth Cohen from Violence Against Women. And it could be that some people are, uh, have left because the hearing went on for a while. Oh, uh, and I've just been corrected. Elizabeth Co Cohen from Voices of Women. Oh, my apologies, Val, Voices of Women. So um, if we could, st if you'd like to start, um, just as other people get settled in, that would be great. Yeah, I'll move us forward as much as I can. And with that in mind, m the testimony it, that's typed that you will receive a copy of, I have gonna leave a lot of it out because it's redundant to what has already been said. Uh, my name is Pat Burkhardt. Uh, I am an advocate for women. I am a midwife and I have a doctor in public health. Uh, I would first like to commend you all for doing this to learn more about this reality as it exists in New York City. 
My testimony today reflects both the global and the local reality. The many and varied voices raised in opposition to FGM, and I use that term in my presentation, have been documented and published by the World Health Organization and multiple associated organizations of the UN. It is a global problem. WHO states that FGM includes procedures that intentionally alter or cause injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons, i.e. for no benefit to the woman. Most critically, the population most impacted by FGM, according to WHO statistics, are girls between infancy and 15. Some choose to equate FGM with male circumcision and in fact call it female circumcision. It is not, unless one considers the removal of the penis as circumcision. Physically, the type of cutting will leave results that range from bad to horrendous, when the goal is to curb women's desire or take away the enjoyment and pleasure of sex, it may be only excision or removal of the clitoris. Added cutting removes the labia minora, i.e. the external tissue around the vagina, or the labia majora, the external tissue further out from there. Healing may fuse these tissues, and they, or they can be purposefully sutured together, resulting in what is called infibulation. As you can imagine, Menstrual bleeding will be held inside the vagina or barely able to leak out. Sexual intercourse will give no pleasure and may be painful, certainly for her and maybe for him. The cultural practice exists in many cultures and, in, and is valued in different ways. However, even in countries where this is practiced, there are objections to its continuing, as previous speakers have attested. A midwife colleague from Malawi told me when I was there that the Ministry of Health had identified cultural practices that were harmful and must be eliminated. FGM is one of those. It has also been characterized as violence against women. If countries where the practices originated label it harmful and to be eliminated, can New York City do less? There are multiple uh, myths about uh, FGM and you can read those on any WHO fact sheet that you choose to look at. Given the international, the multicultural nature of New York City, it is probable that FGM occurs here as an initial practice. If we have no data on FGM occurring in New York City, we need to collect it. Data should include prevalence, i.e. the quantity of the practice that exists, but also qualitative data regarding attitudes and reason, reasons for choosing to have the procedure done and under what circumstances. So we're looking at quantitative as well as qualitative data collection. Collaboration between academic institutions and the Department of Health and its multiple providers might be the model to utilize for this. The collection of data aside, initial infibulation must be made illegal. There will, this will be a process, not a dictum. Communities in which this occurs and the healthcare providers of these communities must be involved in the process of defining, understanding, and ultimately removing it. But it, it has to be, and, and one of the reasons when I wrote this, it's, it should be a process, not a dictum, though we still need it to be illegal, and how you make it illegal and still don't enforce it is your challenge. Because if we do make it illegal as a dictum, then it will be driven underground. And those cultures that believe it is important will continue to do it, but put it in the hands of inexpert, poor practitioners who will do m even more harm than good. It is also clearly true that women's health care providers encounter women who have already been victims of FGM. In this case, if de-infibulation, i.e., the opening of the sutured and fused tissues is done during birth to allow for the passage of the baby, the woman or her family might request re-infibulation. Honoring this patient choice presents a dilemma for most healthcare providers, including midwives. It also needs addressed within communities and ultimately needs to be made illegal. So there, there really are two steps in this process as it exists clinically. Uh, the act of violence against women is strongly opposed against many cultures, across many cultures, and levels of multiple societies. Uh, here in New York City, there are two female populations that must be recognized in the policies that this council elaborates. First and foremost, there are those young girls whose sexual anatomy and physiology are still intact. 
These young girls must be protected from the mutilization cutting that is irreversible and has lifelong consequences and implications, especially if they are too young to share in the decision making and therefore it is not their choice. Second, there are, for the, there are those for whom the decision to cut is in the past, the effects are present and irrevocable. However, to care for them while pregnant or seeking gynecological care, providers critically need to know or learn how to know to care for these women, not only physically, but psychologically and in their spirits, in their souls. When you hear the stories of women who have had this experience imposed on them as infants or as five-year-olds or eight-year-olds, the, 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 the pain and the, and the heartache in these women's voices and in the stories they tell is absolutely horrific. Um, educational materials developed in conjunction with the communities in which these practices exist are essential and need to be developed again by that complex of, since this is such a complex issue, it's complex in the communities that endorse it, it's complex in advocacy communities wanting to better understand and eliminate it, um, it can't just be an either or, it's got to be um, a, a, almost a, a grading of if we do this, we do this, we do this, we, do, we have a range, we have a spectrum of what, but we, we need to look at it from every angle with all of the critically important and interested people who have women's best rights and best, ish, uh, best means at, at heart. The one thing I would ask that you all do, if you just write this down, there is a podcast by Ma Maria Karimji. She's a Pakistani woman who basically told her story on this AmericanLife.org radio archive podcast. It is telling, and it just puts a person, and you've all heard this, some of these stories, but that's another one worth listening to. And that's all. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Zyga, would you like to go next, or would you like to be our last speaker? It's, it's your choice. Here, you need this. Let, uh, let me give it to them, let them go. Oh, okay. okay, I Great. think I should go last, and everybody else should yeah. go first. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like the twins trying no. to get born. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. For uh, I won't take too much time because everything else has already been said. But uh, I wanted to, before I start my testimony, I wanted to make a couple of points of clarity. Uh, the first point of clarity is we need to know who the population in New York is. So most of the population in New York are from West Africa, and West Africa does not perform infibulation. So the issues around infibulation in New York City and the concerns for clinicians wouldn't be necessary because West Africans practice type one, type two. So that's point of clarity. Uh, a second point of clarity I wanted to add is that um, uh, this test, uh, uh, testimony makes it seem that uh, communities are not changing and that there is not uh, changes of culture over the last 30 years since there's been advocacy around these practices in many countries. But you know, research data from reputable scholars across the world have actually documented the prevalence of this practice dropping in many countries, whether it's from Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, whether it is from Senegal, whether it's from Sierra Leone, the prevalence rates are dropping and there is a cultural shift. It is not happening as quickly as we would like to see, but it is happening. And among immigrants and refugees in Europe, there is actually data and research that is showing behavior change and cultural shift that is happening. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in the US is that the perception and the narrative constructed around this topic is that immigrants who come here remain the same as their counterparts in their countries of origin, which is factually incorrect. The process of migration itself is a process of change. And in my work in the community, I've shown over and over again that people's perceptions and attitudes are changing. And to share with you an example, I want to share uh, a story of a mother and daughter, because the issue is not only about access to healthcare and training of clinicians. 
for me, the issue is how do we integrate our new neighbors into our new society? What values do we want to promote? And what values do we want to reject? And how do you ensure that, especially for the communities that are very vulnerable, they are not further targeted and surveilled, especially in the current cli climate? We can't talk about policy without really realizing the political environment we are in. We can't also talk about access to social justice for women when we know that justice is not colorblind. So let me share with you the story of Haja Fatma. Haja Fatma is a woman in her 60s. She lives in Sudan, but her daughter and her son-in-law live in New York. So every year she travels to come and visit them. When she comes to visit them, because she doesn't speak English, she speaks Arabic, Haja Fatma feels isolated in a, her new Brooklyn home. She's often alone. She spends her days watching TV and you know, calling back home to talk with people. I got to know Haja Fatma partly because of South Yetu's uh, community study we've been doing for the last six years. What we've been trying to do is to document the experiences of mothers around the issue of female circumcision. Because that research is actually supporting the data we've done with young girls, oral story we did six years ago. And so we've been doing focus groups with older women, younger women, and younger youth. And they're divided into age groups. So Haja Fatima happened to be the older women between 45 to 60 years old. And her daughter was in the age group of 29, 40, 40, uh, 49 years old. And it's telling between her daughter's perspective around the practice and Haja Fatma's. Haja Fatma believes strongly that this is a practice that honors women. It gives women privilege and pre prestige and respect in the marriage. While her daughter, Samira, you will see in the testimony, who was infibulated when she was five in Sudan, has three daughters. None of her daughters are circumcised. She does not want to have any of it done. She remembers the painful memory. Those two women live in the same house. However, they've never spoken about this practice. It was through the work at South Yetu that they finally begin to talk about it. And I asked Haja Fatma, how come you didn't talk about it to your daughter? She said, what is there to talk about? This was an issue that all of us thought was a good thing to do when we were growing up. It was something that connected you to your peers. It was something that promoted social cohesion. But now I realize my daughter is in a different environment. Her children are American. Just as I am isolated in this new environment, I also don't want her daughters to be isolated in the new environment because I know for me, now being alone without my peers and my friends in Brooklyn is more painful than when I was back home. And I don't want my grandchildren to face that further pain. I shared that story to illustrate two points. A lot of immigrant women, and Africans in particular, don't have it easy to migrate to this country. It wasn't until 1964 that actually immigration was allowed from the continent of Africa. And I mean by that, sub-Saharan Africa. And for a lot of Africans, whether it is refugees, it takes years and years for African refugees to be resettled. And every year, the refugees don't in, even make the quota that the US government allows. So the process of migration for Africans is tough. No African family would want to jeopardize that by continuing to perform a procedure that they know is illegal. There are a lot of African women who have applied for asylum but are in withholding of removal because of FGM, but they do know that their survival and the safety of their children depends on their continuing to stay in this country. They would never jeopardize that. For a lot of the other families, the fear of having your children removed and placed on foster care and you deemed as not a, a good parent is enough traumatizing experience enough for them not to want to do something to damage that opportunity. If there is anything I can leave you 
the city council members in this, in this, in my testimony this morning. I would like you to have the trust that the immigrant families we are working with, people who are trying desperately to make a better life and be good citizens in this country, and that societies are changing, families are changing, and that cultural practices are being left behind. And so when we hear narratives that exaggerate, yes, sometimes in advocacy we need to exaggerate because we need to mobilize, and we need to mobilize not only policy, procedures and protocols, but also resources, we also have to make sure those exaggerations are formed by accurate data. And I wanna assure you that the data today to support that there is the practice continuing underground is not factually incorrect. Say that one is not, fa it, to double, neg uh, double negative, is not factually. The, narr the narrative that the practice continues with immigrants here is not factually true. It is false. The, also the story narrative that there's vacation cutting is factually incorrect. Because again, how do you prove intent that someone is going home to do something when they know the asylum acceptance was based on that fear of persecution. The point I'm saying here is that sometimes, especially with this topic, we've been more susceptible to information that hasn't been supported by independent research. And I wanna close by sharing a case that happened in 2007. Adam Khalid, a young man from Ethiopia, married to a South African, going through marital problems, and he was accused of having circumcised his daughter in Atlanta. The case went to court, he was convicted, served 10 years, and last year he was deported back to Ethiopia. The problem with that story was that the evidence was very slim, Adam Khalid's sisters in Addis Ababa were not circumcised. Their mother never circumcised them. That evidence was not provided in court. But this young man served 10 years in jail and was deported. I highlight that story to say that a lot of public policy legislation was informed not on data, but on emotion. And in the current environment, we have to be extremely careful that we do not unfairly target people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm being told that we need to uh, leave this room by one o'clock. So I'm gonna ask each of the last two um, people who are testifying to please limit your testimony. We have your written testimony. So if you could give, call out the most important parts because I really wanna hear the questions from my colleagues and give them the time. Oh, I wanna recognize Council Member Debbie Rose from Staten Island who has joined us. Thank you. Yes. My name is uh, Asikisi and uh, I'm the founder of uh, Finally Girl Mother. So to fight against female genital mutilation. So I have my testimony written, but it's different from my own story. I'm glad to be here today to testify against FGM. Myself, I have been victim of FGM. When I was married, I was uh, 21 years old. And my husband always asked me, are you a human being or a piece of wood? So this would traumatize me. Since today, where I am, I don't have any feeling with my husband 
I don't like, you know, in the NSN. So I don't have any feeling. And now I'm traumatized. Nighttime when I'm in my bed and my husband opened the door, I, I'm, I, I'm always scared because I don't like him to come to me. Because this, I hate, I'm telling you, I hate relation, uh, sexual relation because I have been traumatized. So till from 21 years to now, I don't have no feeling and I'm traumatized. I never, I, I never make my husband happy because the word he told me at the beginning, beginning he asked me if I'm a piece of wood or because I, I don't have no feeling, no sensation. So he asked me if I'm a human being or a piece of wood. And this word traumatized me. So this is a reason I, I want to tell you today to come to help to f end this mother. The FDM is a crime. And, uh, and uh, we really need, we really need help to stop this mother, you know, because it's a big crime and myself, I'm traumatized. I never feel, I never feel uh, what is uh, the sexual uh, relation, never. I don't, even today, I never feel anything myself. So I need your help. I don't even wish this happened to my first enemy in the world. So if you can help us to end this matter, to make a crime, we really appreciate as a woman. Thank you for coming forward. I can see your suffering yeah. and um, appreciate you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about um, another area that is also um, involves women's health. Um, approximately 50% of women suffer from pelvic or organ prolapse, according to the Cleveland Clinic. A pelvic or in pelvic organ prolapse, muscles and ligaments in the pelvic floor can no longer hold essential organs, such as the bladder, rectum, and uterus in place because they have been severely injured or destroyed, usually by pregnancy and childbirth. These unsupported organs drop down into the pelvis and into the vagina or bulge prolapse through the front or back of the vaginal wall, sometimes out of the vaginal opening. The result is often the leakage of urine and feces or incontinence or the inability to completely void. <clears throat> Stress urinary incontinence is the involuntary leakage of urine. Of the 18 million adults who suffer from stress urinary incontinence, 85% are women. Even minor physical activities of daily living like laughing, coughing, and lifting can trigger incontinence. This kind of injury greatly impacts a woman's ability to function sexually and may make sex impossible for her. Every area of a woman's life is impacted and diminished, including her life at home and at work. Yet millions of women are suffering in silence and due to shame and embarrassment about their condition, don't talk about it publicly. U.S. World and News Reports recently said that pelvic organ prolapse is something of a secret ec epidemic given that it is rarely talked about in polite company. Just as not that long ago, breast cancer was not discussed in public and women with, with few free treatment options often died from it. What made the difference was that women demanded research and better treatment options and that insurance companies now cover diagnostic procedures such as mammograms for early detection. I know four people, family members and friends who are still with us today because of the actions women took to improve the situation. There is a tremendous need for women to do the same for pelvic organ pro prolapse. We need better treatment options that are safe and restore women's organs to being able to function normally and that will last for a lifetime. Treatment options have changed little. Pest I am so sorry. Yes. We have zero time. Okay. I one last sentence, please, and with all due respect and with apologies, we sure. have your testimony. Okay. So please, if you could not read from your testimony, Absolutely. if you have one last sentence, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the council members who have very limited time. Absolutely. Um, basically, I, I feel this is a related area. 
because um, sometimes during um, these treatments, especially surgical treatments, organs um, that are vital to women's functioning, such as their uterus and their ovaries, are removed without their consent. And um, there's an organization called the HERS Foundation that has documented this substantially. Um, and I think it's very important that Got it. new research be applied to treatments of this, this very pervasive female disability. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. We heard a wide range of testimony, and I appreciate all of you. Um, council members uh, who are both being very polite, deferring to each other. Council member Rose, do you want to <coughs> start us off? Thank yes. you. I want to I want to apologize. Um, today was like a, a, a crazy day. No apology. Okay. Um, so I, I hope I'm not being redundant in any um, if uh, anything that was already discussed. But um, and hi, Sotiefsky. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. That's a Shaolin shout out. Um, I, I, I want to know, um, do you think, what are the outreach um, methods that have, uh, that, that have been employed to, um, to reach out to communities where FGM um, might be prevalent? Um, are the needs of um, the women actually being met? And what is it that we should, um, as legislators, make sure that um, it, that we're able to help this community with? I know they weren't very articulately placed questions, but. Uh, I can answer that question in two parts. So I think that there is a lot of uh, community engagement and outreach that's happening. Uh, with, we're doing one, but we also partner with a lot of other ethnic specific organizations across the city to do not only just work around this issue, but work around other you know, social issues, in, you know, including how do we promote you know, education for our you know, mothers who are not able to read and so forth and so forth. And so this topic is one of the issues that we incorporate. But I think this topic is a little bit you know, sensitive because of the, um, the public glare it has had that people are very afraid of talking. Partly because they are afraid if I say something what the consequences might be. So whenever you bring it up, everybody shuts up. Um, I think in the early, in the mid 90s when the federal government was trying to pass the federal law, they did a lot of listening sessions across the country and we did some in New York. At that time, the communities were very interested in having conversation. It was easy, you could go into and pull together community forums and people would talk. And then when the law passed, everybody you know, shut up. And then in the early 2000s, you couldn't say anything about women's health at the national level, at the local level. So no one said anything. And then now uh, the topic is coming up. And the two feelings in the communities, and I say communities because they are diverse. So one feeling is that uh, policymakers are not that interested in this topic. They want to use it as a currency. Because if they were seriously interested about it, they will follow through with the proper interventions and proper support. So that's one. Um, then the, the second one is the internal community dynamics that are happening. You know, uh, there is challenges of social structures, familial connections. Uh, more, for example, more women are working outside the home than they were from the countries of origin. And so the questions about what it means to be the head of household is now being asked. And FGC comes into it. Because then the notions of what was defined as feminine now are being con you know, challenged in this new environment. Mm -hmm. 
with limited opportunities for public discourse because everybody is afraid of what I say and what the punitive consequences will be for me and my family. So um, these um, are, are are these incidents reported as domestic violence incidents, and is there ever any oh, well, follow I mean, through? I in the communities, actually, FGC is not connected to domestic violence at all. I think this is the connection to DV is actually service providers, you know, designation. A lot of community members, whether it is the, some women themselves, whether it's men in the community, it is a cultural practice that they don't associate with gender-based violence. And that is something we also need to really look at how individuals in various communities perceive and self-define, because that's also important. Because if we use designation that does not resonate with people, we're not going to get people mobilized enough to come to the table to say, this is what we want to do. So we have to find a language that resonates in the communities. And so for the outreach and community engagement, we've used uh, community media, whether it's print, whether it's radio. Uh, we've used um, different storytellings and uh, folk stories. Uh, we've used uh, community leaders, you know, ethnic associations. We've used a lot of religious institutions. So I, I, we've... I appreciate um, the, the depth. And I'm, I'm going to reach out to you personally yes. because I, I do want my colleague to be able to ask her question. But um, I just want to know, do you think there's enough counseling services um, that are available to women um, who have been traumatized no. um, uh, that, that could deal with this type of no. trauma? No. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to let my guest. Just in the interest of time, that was, the, that was my same line of questioning. Um, and so what do you think we can do? Do you think that we should maybe um, like take a step back from, and you were here during the testimony from the city, um, should we take a step back from that line of, of, of not questioning, but um, um, ways of looking at policy and do more work um, with the community-based organizations? And then also, even with this hearing, this is a public hearing that um, you know, will be videotaped and, and, mm -hmm. and the opportunity for people to review it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I understand the, some of the risk in the language, and yeah. especially in this climate, this political climate, and, mm -hmm. and, um, and the you know, powers that be using mm -hmm. information to be able to then um, ostracize or you know, ice will step in, and mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen, um, and unintended consequences, right? And so um, do you think that how we should move forward as a council mm -hmm. um, to stay, take a step back from the policy side of it? Is that what you're you know, thinking no, and do more with community-based organizations? Uh, I wouldn't say that you should step back, but I, sh I would say that we should expand who is around the table or who we should be talking to. So for example, in addition to this hearing, it would be nice, I'm sure all of you have council district officers, to organize small you know, meetings with different community members to kind of say, what is going on? What are you thinking about? You know, what do you think we need to bear in mind as we're deliberating what we need to do? So that you have a little bit more diverse opinions to be able to make informed decisions and informed policy. Can, can I just add one more thing? Sorry. We yeah, do. That's the problem. Well, I've asked the hearing that is starting at 1 o'clock for an extra 10 minutes. No, oh. Another hearing and or a roundtable discussion. Oh, for roundtable. Yeah, roundtable. thank you for that. Um, did you, can I, I, we go? No, you need to go. I mean, we need to go. I also. Um, actually would like to end this hearing with your questions and your answer. So um, thank everyone so much for coming and testifying today. You will uh, hear follow-up from this committee.
Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.